um, it's nearly 30 years, which is hard to believe, I think, um, since fire destroyed the Norwich Central Library and, of course, the record office, um, leading to its replacement by the Forum and the splendid archive centre where we are today, at least those of you who are in the audience. Um, this uh, was not the first, and it certainly wasn't the worst such disaster to befall a city that the 16th century physician and cartographer, William Cunningham, uh, described as being, and I'm quoting, much subject to fires, which have not a little hindered the beauty thereof. And uh, here is a map that Cunningham produced of the city of Norwich. Um, it was, it was uh, drawn up in 1558. Um, we're facing east here. Um, and uh, by the time that he produced this map, of course, there had been the fire of 1508 that I'm going to talk about today and fires occasioned by Ketz rebels in 1549. But in addition to that, there were um, fires in the north of the city up here, just get used to this little gizmo, which is up here near Magdalen Street. Whoops, Magdalen Street's not there, it's here. Um, and that was, uh, those were caused in about 1004 uh, when King Spine set fire to the city. And there were other fires in the north part of the city around just before the time of Doomsday Book. Hmm. And then in addition to that, um, of course, there were fires at the cathedral. Um, the cathedral just, whoops, just get used to this. The cathedral here. Um, the cathedral burnt down several times, once by arson in 1272. But there were also fires in 1171, 1463, which are really quite major and affected the surrounding areas. And again, the Franciscan Friary, which is um, which is down here um, in the side of the city, just whoops, about down here. This is very, very rebellious. This little gizmo. Um, <laughs> um, that was burnt down in twelve sixty eight and had to be rebuilt from scratch. Henry the Third gave a grant of money towards it, and then there were, of course, the unfortunate um, Dominicans down here. Uh, there. Cam uh, their sort of precinct uh, to the south burnt down in 1413, allegedly, according to one Westminster chronicler, along with the best part of the city. But we have no local evidence of that. And then across the river, just across the river, their north precinct burnt down in 1449. So there were a lot of fires. And the last one we need to remember before 1508 was in this part of Norwich, um, down here, Home Street, where the Great Hospital is, caught fire in 1497, but the, uh, the fire was contained. Uh -huh. Now, of course, these weren't unique to Norwich, um, certainly not. Fires were a notorious hazard of, of urban life in the Middle Ages. Um, and it's hardly surprising when you think about the widespread use of inflammatory building materials. Um, there was timber, straw, the ubiquitous use, uh, 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 ubiquity of dangerous crafts <clears throat> in densely populated areas. Um, and people had the habit of stacking firewood in large piles outside their dwellings. Um, and there were strenuous efforts on the part of most magistrates to eliminate these and other notorious hazards. Um, and then again, you've got to think about the open hearths, the portable braziers, the candles, the torches that warmed and lit the houses of all but the destitute. And I should say, I've looked at a lot of coroner's reports and many of these fires were caused by that fatal combination of drink and alcohol, alcohol and candles. And people going up to bed a little bit tipsy and the next thing they know, they've set fire to their mattress and then the house burns down. Um, but of course you have um, industries like, for example, dyeing, um, which is practiced widely in Norwich, which is a cloth producing center. Um, and uh, the, the fires that dyers used were often a cause of um, major incidents. In Tiverton, in Devon, as late as 1612, most of the town burnt down because a dyer 
had overheated his furnace and the straw roof next door caught fire. Um, other victims of fires, of course, are children and they um, incidents involving children often lead to wholesale fires. I don't think health and safety would consider this to be particularly laudable, uh, but at least the child is being supervised. Um, often children weren't. Now, surprisingly, at least it surprises me, that under these alarming circumstances, the Norwich city authorities adopted comparatively few of the precautionary measures recorded elsewhere in England, notably regarding the prohibition of combustible building materials, such as thatch, which they belatedly, this is after 1508, recognized as a notorious fire hazard. And I'm quoting, especially when the wind arises and blows the flakes from house to house, which is of course how fires spread often. And I think it's worth just stopping to consider how really dangerous thatch is. And I'm going to give two modern examples and they're both local. Um, this is from Beechamwell Church in Norfolk in February, 2022. Now notice this is February, it's not in the middle of summer when thatch is really dry. And um, the works were being done on the lead part of the roof apparently. And a spark uh, from a welder hit or lit the thatch and uh, despite 60 trained firefighters and I think uh, something like 10 engines turning up they were unable to save the the straw roof uh, which went up very very quickly and interestingly this is the cause of many many fires in the middle ages you know a spark from some um, builder's material you know if they're if they've got lead or something um, will lead to a, a fire. Um, and also, uh, just another one, this is from Hengrave in April 2022, and uh, I was very sad to see uh, on Anglia News last week that there'd been more fires in Hengrave of a row of thatched cottages. And in this instance, this fire here, the 2022 one, um, there was something like 14 fire engines came immediately because they'd been on an exercise nearby, but even then they couldn't control the flames affecting the roof. And, and this really underscores how uh, vulnerable um, congested urban spaces that used thatch were. Now in London, in 1212, after a series of devastating fires, the city introduced draconian regulations, forbidding thatch, insisting on stone party walls, and introducing a whole load of safety measures to be used in fires. And it's worth noting that from 1212 until 1666, London didn't have a major fire. There were lots of small ones, which the chroniclers report, but they were put, put down, they were, they were contained because the fire system, the, the fire prevention system in London was so good. We tend to think of medieval people as being a bit supine in the face of disaster, but this certainly wasn't the case in London. But Norwich didn't follow this ruling. Um, many other towns did, Winchester, Bristol, for example, even Oswestry and, and Flint, places like that, which aren't on the top tier of towns. But, but, but Norwich did not, it continued to use that. Nor uh, were all Norwich parishes properly equipped with buckets, ladders, and the fire hooks that were used to pull down burning buildings. Um, London had very strict rules on this score, but Norwich, I'm afraid to say, was a bit slapdash. And we know this from the assembly books, which are kept here in the record office. Um, for example, um, every parish in Norwich was supposed to have a pair of these crooms. Uh, crooms are the other hooks, the fire hooks, these big fire hooks. Um, which are used to uh, pull down burning buildings and they create a fire break so that the fire can't spread from one roof to the next. Um, they're, they're big. Um, you need two large men to, to sort of, uh, or very large women to, um, to manage them. Uh, these, are, these are medieval chromes or fire hooks from Canterbury and they were kept next to the medieval bakery in, in, the, in the priory because bakeries were where you often had fires. <laughs> 
Um, but Norwich was 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 not good about this because a, a survey in 1423 regulations were issued for having them. But about 10 years later, it was reported that the parishes were so frightened of people stealing them that they locked them away. <laughs> so that when fire broke out, nobody could get them or else they hadn't bothered to buy them in the first instance. And there was there was quite a, there was a bit slapdash about this kind of thing. There were no rules either, as obtained in London, about every householder having a bucket of water outside their home, uh, which they were supposed to do, um, particularly in summer. Um, and Norwich didn't do this. It may have been that because the city had so many streams, open streams, wells and ponds at this time, that they felt it wasn't worth bothering. But this was to prove disastrous in um, 1508. <laughs> okay, well, let's get up to 1508, having looked at that background. Um, in this year, not 1507, but 1508, um, there were at least uh, two fires in the city. Um, the first one uh, we know to have broken out in the poorer area over the water north of the Wensum in March. And we know from a combination of archeological and documentary sources that this fire, which is up here, didn't consume the two parishes which are shaded in, but just a tiny area where my little red dot is now, probably about at most nine or 10 houses. But the archaeological and the documentary evidence suggest that it wasn't much more. But it crossed over the parochial boundary from All Saints Firebridge into St Paul's Spittle Land, which is why it looks so big, because two parishes uh, were involved. The second fire, at least, there may have been three, but there was certainly a second one, uh, occurred in June 1508. And that was much, much, much more serious. It devastated this swathe, the, the um, north, south of the Wensum, of 12 and perhaps 14 parishes. And it was really bad. Uh, almost the entire housing stock in this area was destroyed. Now, you see that, that, that a couple of these are shaded the other way. And this is because I don't have written evidence or archeological evidence specific to that parish of fires. There is a little bit of evidence um, up here of some fire taking place at some time in the early 16th century, because there's a bit of burnt straw, but it's not really sufficient uh, proof to, to be absolutely certain that it was affected in 1508. Um, the other problem one here is number 12, which is St. Michael at Plea, where there's no evidence uh, in, in the documents, but I think it would have been an absolute miracle if it had escaped because it's surrounded by burning parishes, so I've included it here. So what we're looking at effectively is the middle of Norwich, um, and this was the richest part of the city, too. We have to bear that in mind. By the end of the 16th century, there was considerable confusion about these dates. Everybody agreed they were all 1508, but some people thought that there had been another horribilie incendium or horrible fire in April. Uh, and there may have been, but we don't have evidence of that actually at the time. But we do know that there were at least two fires in 1508. By the end of the 16th century, a French surgeon implausibly named Peter Johnson, which doesn't sound very Gallic to me, was said to have started the June fire. Now, no such person appears in the civic records, and trust me, I have looked very carefully. Um, although a Leonard Tellion, or Leonard, or Leon Tellion, um, a surgeon from Gascony, is known to have lived in the parish uh, up here, of All Saints Firebridge. Um, so he may have been the one involved. Um, what is interesting is he complained um, in, in uh, 1422 to the civic authorities of being victimized because he was a foreigner, even though he had letters from Henry VIII 
of um, being um, sort of uh, allowed to um, allowed to live in the city. Um, it, this was a period when foreigners were often scapegoated. Uh, well, sometimes they still are today, aren't they? But um, uh, it may be that because he was he was French and he lived in one of the areas, people subsequently blamed him. But there's no evidence of this at the time. Now, what surprises me is that a crisis of this magnitude, and it's arguably one of the worst fires in early modern England, has been largely forgotten, uh, despite the profusion of archival and archaeological evidence that testifies to its lasting impact. It had a really, um, it had a really significant effect on the city for decades afterwards. The few references to Norwich's great fire that do appear in print tend to be confused and inaccurate, and he usually refer to 1507 as the date of the fires. Um, this is because they're based on an account in the fourth volume of Francis Bloomfield's Essay Towards a Topographical History of the County of Norfolk. Um, this appeared in, at the beginning of the 19th century uh, in 1510-11. But Bloomfelt himself, and here he is in the frontispiece of his volume, died in 1752. So this is a very long time uh, for these misconceptions to circulate. Bloomfield mistook the dates of the fire as 1507 rather than 1508, which they're clearly dated in all the surviving records, and believed mistakenly that there'd been widespread damage to the north as well as the south of the Wensen. He believed that most of the north of Norwich had been burnt to the ground as well, which is not the case. He misread a considerable amount of evidence while failing to appreciate the significance of other material, which he ignored. Now, this shouldn't detract from the, his achievements as an antiquary, which were amazing. I mean, he was a very great scholar, and I think his volumes on, on the history of Norfolk are, 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 are are really worthwhile and, and, and very, very impressive. We all make mistakes. I certainly make a lot of mistakes in my writing, but they usually get found out a lot quicker. And 270 years is a long time for people to have so many misconceptions about, about the fire. And certainly when I started writing on Norwich, I believed all this, you know, this has only dawned on me, you know, very, very gradually. Contemporary evidence, produced a short time after the March and June fires and kept here in the Norfolk Record Office where you can, you can come and look at them, enables us to compile a more accurate, if far from comprehensive account of what really happened and which parishes were affected. And according to the surviving documents, which are very full, some of the heaviest losses occurred around the marketplace, which is round here, uh, this part of Norwich, and the commercial heart of the city. But the impact on the businesses and homes across all 12 or 14 parishes was catastrophic. Archaeological excavations in Pottergate, and i just point out um, up, to see, um, just up here, if you can see that. My little gizmo has disappeared. I'm not sure where it's gone. Um, arch archaeological excavations in Pottergate during the 1970s confirmed that a blaze of remarkable intensity ripped through a row of properties south of St. Lawrence's Church, burying the owner's possessions in rubble as the buildings collapsed. And um, it's just here. St. Lawrence's is just here. So it's just this bit of Norwich here. And we've got some amazing uh, um, findings. This is um, a pilgrim badge, which was dug out of the, the collapsed buildings. You get a very good idea of how artisans lived in this period. They had a very high standard of living, a lot of consumer goods. And this is a pilgrim badge from Aachen. Um, of the, it's a shrine of the Virgin's uh, shift that she wore when Christ was born. And you can see on the back, which is the image, if you're looking at the screen on your right, if you're um, uh, 
um, that uh, it sustained, it was, it was burnt um, quite badly, but um, the archeologists um, managed to retrieve it. Two important contemporary accounts of, of the fire um, obviously, he didn't know about the archaeology of Bloomfield, but Bloomfield also um, um, didn't, didn't notice two contemporary accounts of the fire, um, which is surprising because they both stress um, its devastating impact. Um, and this is the first one. Uh, sorry, this is the second. I'm, I'm going to come to this in a minute. Um, just go back to this. Um, the first is the uh, Great Chronicle of London which was written by an anonymous Londoner. Um, and it was written almost at the time. This is not something that was produced retrospectively years later. Um, now this chronicler rarely took any account of the provinces. They were sort of beneath his attention. He stuck to London. But he began his account for 1508 with a breathless report, and I quote, of that huge and marvelous fire the which consumed so many households and churches within the city of Norwich in the month of June. So he's very clear and specific. And then he goes on to add that uh, two years later in 1510, a fundraising appeal was staged in churches throughout England, revealing the extent of the damage. So that the people of Norwich had permission from the king to send proctors around various places, including London, to appeal in the pulpit for people to uh, contribute funds towards the recovery of the city. And this is the only evidence we have of a national fundraising campaign. This is in a period before fire insurance. People don't have the sort of thing that you get in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. And the first um, national uh, attempts to provide support for fire damaged communities were in the 1570s. So you're really on your own as a town or city if you have a fire. You, you've got to do the best you can for yourself. We don't know how much money was raised in this exercise, and we don't know how it was apportioned. But we do know that it must have been quite impressive. This is the second piece of evidence, and this is a poem by the future poet, poet laureate, John Skelton, and I'm very grateful to Professor Matt Woodcock, um, who drew my attention to these verses. Um, Skelton, at this point, was rector of Dis, which is about 20 miles south of Norwich. He had a lot of friends at the cathedral, and he was always popping up to the city uh, for dinner and such, so we, we, we know that he would have seen the city. And he wrote this, it was in Latin, but there's a translation here for you, um, of the awful devastation. And um, I won't read all of it, but he says, oh, calamity all too tearful. Oh, what a lamentable fate. In hateful fires you fall, venerable city. Whether the lightnings of Job or the ultimate fates were summoning in the swift fires of Vulcan parish. It's very dramatic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it seems a bit less forceful when we realise that he's copying the ancient um, verses that were written on the fall of, say, Troy or Carthage. Um, this is a trope. It's a, it's, a, it's a formula. And people were probably, although I haven't come across others, turning out similar verses for similar fires in similar places. But it, it still gives a real, uh, you know, sense of what a, what impact this um, this fire must have had. You can almost smell the burning ashes, can't you? You know, when you when you read it, and uh, um, and there is a picture of the youthful and very un, um, unclerical looking skeleton. So the big question is, how did the rulers of Norwich respond to such a challenge? In the third week of July, 1508, um, the assembly, which comprised 60 councillors, 24 aldermen, the mayor and other senior officers, ordered the removal of all rubble and rotting matter from the streets to designated places, while the chamberlain took steps to clear the river of the burnt thatch and other rubbish that had been dumped there. 
Uh, now, clearly, they needed to keep the Wensum free for navigation because uh, the, the city relies on ships coming up from Yarmouth uh, and going back to Yarmouth for trade. But also at this time, there were fears of plague. And at this time, people believed that bad smells transmit plague. And so um, the, the, the city's worried that all this burning matter is going to create miasmas, which is why the Chamberlain um, acted so quickly. By the start of August, August 1508, the authorities had made a sufficiently detailed assessment of the destruction and the putative cost of rebuilding to present a case for financial support to Henry VII and the Privy Council. Uh, we don't know what the petition said, but we do know that the mayor and the leading civic officers who rode up to, to London cost the city 40 shillings in a horse hire and accommodation because that's what the Chamberlain paid them. Chamberlain's accounts are a wonderful source of evidence for this kind of thing. Now, Henry VII was notoriously tight-fisted, as I'm sure you know, and he refused to cough up. So he didn't give any aid himself, but he did obviously let them have this fundraising activity, which of course they had to pay for themselves. When Henry VIII came to the throne, the city tried again. But he was equally negative in his response, so he didn't offer any money either. And this might suggest that perhaps the fire wasn't quite as bad as um, certainly Bloomfield believed. It, 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 it may, they may by this point have been staging something of a recovery. The city had asked Henry to remit the subsidies which were then being demanded to fund the war with France. Uh, you will, I'm sure, be aware that the Battle of Flodden uh, took place in 1513 while Henry was campaigning in France. So this was a time of, of warfare. Um, so um, they had no luck there. Instead, the uh, ruling elite decided to redistribute the contributions that were raised from each subward of the city towards a routine tax known as the Tenth that every English town and city paid um, routinely to the crown. Uh, in the countryside, people paid fifteenths. In the towns, they paid tenths. And these were distributed um, among the population of every town and city. And in Norwich, they were, um, they were taxed by subward. And these are the subwards of the city as they were in 1508. And um, what is uh, particularly interesting is that the areas that were affected by the fire, as we saw in my previous map, those ones in the center, and I'm afraid my little, oh, here it is. That's wonderful, it's come back again. These areas down here were reduced, reduced, St. Peter Mancroft was reduced very dramatically while the other wards, that is those to the south, Conisford, South Conisford, Bear Street and St. Stephen, and all those to the north were increased. And we can see from this, uh, we get a good idea from this uh, readjustment, um, the effect that the fire had. Uh, um, for example, St. Peter Mancroft's contribution went down from 11 pounds to just under eight pounds. So, you know, it was, there were substantial reductions. Um, now, interestingly, um, uh, Bloomfield wasn't aware of this. Um, the readjustments took place in a very, very heated meeting of the mayor's court in 1512. And we can tell it was heated because the poor guy who was keeping the minutes kept scratching and rewriting and scratching and then turning over the page and scratching again until they'd worked out exactly how to reapportion it. And you can imagine the alderman sort of uh, having a bit of a set too as to who was going to pay more. Um, a neat copy of the readjustments were written into the Liber Albus, which was the, the, the big city record, the white book of the city. Now we know that Bloomfield looked at this because he was very naughty. He used to leave his mark in the margin and he used to put an ink circle with a cross in it against all the records that he looked at. So if you go through the city records, you can think, oh, Bloomfield read that. Um, so we know that he looked at the Liber Albus, but he doesn't seem to have realized that these reapportionments reflected the effect 
of the fire and the failure of the ruling elite to get support from the crown. Interestingly, these new rates remained in place until 1547. Um, and they were extremely unpopular because the areas that were carrying um, the heavier burden were the poorer areas of the city, while the richer areas, which had been the ones that had been burnt, uh, continued to get relief after much of them had been rebuilt. Um, after the, um, the merchants who lived there had constructed for themselves handsome new houses in brick, flint and tile. And we can see, for example, this is the house in Tombland, uh, which was rebuilt or built by Augustine Steward. Augustine Steward was three times mayor of Norwich uh, and he was um, uh, obviously around at this time. Chris King, in his study of Norwich housing, uh, points out uh, very convincingly that the move towards superior building matter uh, and, and these houses, uh, these larger, better built houses, was already uh, uh, well, in, well, well advanced in the 15th century. And the fire really just, just accelerated this trend. Um, but certainly uh, a lot of rebuilding uh, by leading members of the elite uh, took place. And these men, men like Stuart, recovered very quickly. By 1524, Norwich ranked as the most prosperous provincial city in England in terms of taxable personal wealth. And this is the wealth in the hands of individual people. So some of its merchants were among the richest in England. And the subward of Middle Weimar, which had been the most heavily affected by the fire, was where the richest of them lived. Whatever else they may have destroyed, environmental disasters tended to reinforce rather than undermine social and economic inequalities. And in 1524 5, 2% of the individuals contributing to the parliamentary subsidy of that year controlled over half the city's wealth. It's really it's just like today, I suppose, isn't it? Um, you know, large amounts of wealth in very few hands. There was, by contract, uh, a massive substratum of people who were too poor to pay any tax. So you've got the people like, like Stuart who, who are doing very well, but you also have people who are not doing so well. And it's certainly the case that leading citizens profited from the great fire of Norwich, seizing the opportunity to acquire prime sites for redevelopment on singularly advantageous terms. As you can imagine, the market was flooded with properties to rent or to let, uh, burn properties where you could rebuild. Some, including the under-sheriff Richard Catlin, were accused of manipulating the law to their own advantage in fabricated boundary disputes and there are quite a lot of these cases. This is from the National Archives, this is a Star Chamber case, where a man called Edward Wood appeals to the court on the ground that he can't get justice in Norwich because he's, he's prosecuting the sheriff. Um, and that the sheriff in a, a boundary dispute had claimed to own much more property than he actually did and had taken into his own hands some of Wood's own land. And one of the interesting things about this case, among many, is that both men had been building their new houses with tiled roofs. Um, they both state this. So, as I say, the, the, the property market was flooded with burnt ground, especially as many landowners couldn't afford to rebuild themselves. The cathedral priory, the great hospital, even the city, the corporation, preferred to let land out cheap to people who would rebuild on it on long leases. And you, if you had the money, you could pick up real bargains. It's a bit like PPE during COVID, you know. Um, and, and people were, were, were able to uh, drive very good bargains because landowners are desperate um, to get tenants. And um, this is... Um, this is noted by the civic authorities. Um, in 1570, um, the assembly complained that many goodly buildings and houses 
have become gardens and orchards where once lived craftsmen and others to the great commodity and advantage of this commonwealth. And Norwich was a very rural city. And of course, by this time, uh, Ketz rebels had, had torched the, e the east side of the city as well. So there had been added, um, added fire damage. But I don't want to give the impression that the ruling elite are all in it for themselves. Um, that would be unfair. Uh, many of them were extremely um, civic minded. They, they, they were very generous in what they did. Um, for example, uh, one philanthropist, this man, Robert Janis, um, with death as a tip staff, um, uh, uh, he gave um, three houses, he rebuilt three houses near the market, which had been burned, and he gave them to the city to pay for street cleaning schemes. Um, and he gave over other sums of money too. And it's interesting to note that this civic portrait of him was based on stained glass in the Guildhall in Norwich, which had verses uh, um, reminding his fellow aldermen that they should give generously to civic schemes for the benefit of the community and for the benefit of their own souls. Um, another alderman named John Jewell left 20 pounds in his will to be rebuild the market and his executors doubled it to 40 pounds and we know from the chamberlain's accounts that this 40, 40 pounds in fact 41 pounds was spent on exactly that so um it's clear that that, that that some of these people they weren't just taking advantage of the fire they were putting their hands in the pockets and, and helping to reconstruct um, the city Determined to avoid another disaster, the Assembly, meanwhile, passed a series of bylaws forbidding the use of thatch, backed up by the threat of increasingly heavy fines of 20 shillings or more and other punitive sanctions. Now, London, as, as we've seen, has been doing this since 1212, but now Norwich begins to do it. I should point out 20 shillings is a lot of money. A working, a labourer would earn the equivalent of 2p in current coinage a day. So 20 shillings is, is, is a lot. So if you're fined 20 shillings, that, that's, that's a substantial amount of money. Within a few weeks of the fire, the former mayor, Robert Gardner, he, he, here he is, celebrated for his support of various civic projects. He's described as mayor of this most commodious city. Um, it insisted in leases that he negotiated with carpenters that all his burnt properties should be rebuilt with tile roofs. And um, in fact, he, he made the stipulation also in his will. Um, he died shortly afterwards. Not everybody was so compliant, however, largely on the ground of cost and convenience, and also because of the widespread attachment to traditional building materials, which lay readily to hand. Reed, you can get reed anywhere, you can get it from the broads, you can get it from the river. Um, and Norwich is a rural city, even before yeah. this, this fire. Um, as a result of the Black Death, there were, there were a lot of vacant plots. And it may be that people felt that because the city was a bit rustic, it was all right to use rural building materials. Um, and uh, certainly in a poem of the 13th century, one of the first things that the poet notes the city is famous for is its thatched roofs. People were attached to thatch. Sure, that rhymes, doesn't it? But they liked it. They, they thought it was, um, it was attractive as well as being cheap. And it's interesting that a list of fines raised by the ward constables in 1530 reveals that all 14 of the most serious offenders, all of them were aldermen. And these were the men who had passed the rules. <laughs> Sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Um, so you pass rules, but you don't obey them yourself. Um, and they felt free to ignore them. And, and what is interesting is it's not their houses that they're thatching, but their pigsties and their barns and the accommodation that they are renting to the urban poor. Um, and that itself is, is, is worth noting. Tradition apart, Rebuilding in tile, stone and brick with fire resistant chimneys was, of course, far more expensive. 
not least because of the expert workmanship, as well as the materials involved, which had to be transported from quite, quite long distances. Whereas in the low countries, in, in towns such as Leiden and Ghent, the urban authorities provided subsidies for entire neighbourhoods to be rebuilt in stone, uh, no such support was available in cash strapped Norwich. Individual merchants may have assembled substantial fortunes, but the city itself was run on an increasingly tight budget. The Assembly's decision in 1532 to scrap its campaign on thatch and allow people to, to roof their houses in any way they liked, um, really reflects harsh economic reality and growing fear of popular discontent. This is a period of uh, inflation, galloping inflation, of um, really serious problems in the international cloth industry, which of course Norwich is part of, and uh, food shortages. So um, people are really caught in a, a very, very tight position. Riots, food riots were breaking out in the city. And, and the authorities are aware that if, if that city is going to recover, cheap housing is going to be available for the poor, then um, it should be built at whatever cost in terms of fire risk. And in 1532, when these rulings are introduced, the authorities also insist that anyone who's got a big house should get a ladder just in case a fire breaks out. Um, so this is another regulation. I, th I think they were sort of recognizing that fires might happen again. And archeological evidence from poorer parts of Norwich, um, such as the end of St. Benedict's, um, when you get near um, near New Mills, that, that, that part of the city, um, we know from archeological excavations that in the 16th century, um, thatch was still being widely used. The rulers of Norwich were more successful with regard to the tracts of abandoned wasteland that had defaced the city centre for decades, posing a serious threat to health and commerce alike. Faced with the problem of forcing uncooperative owners to clear and enclose derelict plots that attracted flytippers and vagrants, the authorities adopted the novel precedent of an appeal to Parliament for power to take over these sites in other words, to put them into compulsory ownership. And this is a pioneering measure. It's, it's not been done before anywhere in England. Thanks to the friendship, um, his friendship with Thomas Cromwell, King Henry's chief minister. It's always good to have a Holbein, isn't it? Um, the Norwich MP, Richard Littleproud, was able to secure the very first of several acts for the re-edification of towns in 1534, and thus to convert 14 sites, which I quote, were replenished with much uncleanness and filth into a marketable asset. The city takes them over and rebuilds on them and lets them out at competitive rents. Uh, this sounds something obvious now, but it, it was a really pioneering thing to do. And, and Norwich had a reputation for, for having, being very forward looking, despite its retrograde attitude um, to thatch. Ironically, uh, one of these sites belonged to another of Cromwell's friends, the mayor, Augustine Stewart, uh, who had escaped confiscation because of his financial support for other city ventures. And he did, he did agree to clear the site, mend his ways and build on it, which is exactly what he did. So after a long struggle, uh, Norwich could at last uh, bask again in its reputation as a most commodious city even though quite a bit of it was still thatched rather than tiled. So to, just to conclude very briefly, recent research into the fire history of pre-modern European towns, which um, if I dare say it is a, is a hot topic among historians, um, highlights the importance of local case studies in helping us to understand how and why conflagrations occurred in the past and in helping us to understand how people responded or coped or failed to cope with these traumatic events. And responses are very varied, very different from one place to another. We can also determine how hard it could be to translate precept into practice, 
especially in times of economic hardship. And one of the things that is really illuminating to me is the problems the city had in getting people to adopt thatch. You tend to assume as a historian that if rules are passed, people obey them, but of course they don't. Um, and, and that again is an interesting case in point. So with so much material at our disposal, and with such a wealth of archives as we have here in, in, in the Norfolk Record Office, I do think it's time to get a new look at the fires of 1508, not 1507. Thank you.